Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar. The title of our session today is Analysis and Potential Amendments to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, Preparing for Reform in 2022. My name is April Wepler and I'm the Engagement Coordinator for the Healthy Great Lakes Program at the Canadian Environmental Law Association. And uh, we're really pleased today to be co-hosting our session with Nature Canada. So to start off with, I'll just let you know where I am in the world. I am grateful to live on the banks of the Speed River in Guelph on the traditional lands of the Attawandran, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples under treaty with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And I should also tell you a little bit about the Canadian Environmental Law Association or CELA for those of you who might not know us. So CELA is a specialty legal aid clinic within the Ontario wide networks of clinics that are funded by Legal Aid Ontario. And we work to protect human health and our environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change those policies to prevent such problems in the first place. And as a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who receive less of a say, less of a say in decision making. And as I mentioned, we're co-hosting our webinar today with Nature Canada and Nature Canada is one of the oldest national nature conservation charities in Canada. For 80 years, Nature Canada has helped protect over 110 million acres of parks and wildlife areas in Canada and countless species. Today, Nature Canada represents a network of over 100,000 members and supporters and more than 800 nature organizations. Nature Canada is engaging in the modernization of SEPA in order to protect the genetic integrity of wild species and ecosystems and to ensure that Indigenous people's rights are respected. So just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping, um, as we always do at the beginning of our sessions. Uh, today, we are using the Zoom webinar platform, and that means you may have noticed that you're all in listen-only mode. Um, we're thrilled that we had such um, interest and demand for today's session, um, so to protect the audio quality of the webinar, um, you are all in listen-only mode, and you won't be able to unmute yourselves. We do want to hear from you, though. So you have two ways to get in touch with us. Uh, the chat feature that you're all very familiar with, we would encourage you to use the chat to share your name, uh, your organization, your land acknowledgement, where you're joining us from, anything like that that, uh, that you'd like to tell us about yourself, you can do in the chat. You can also send me a message directly through the chat if you're having any tech issues during the webinar. And then we also have the Q&A feature. So there's an icon at the bottom of your Zoom window that says Q&A, and we would ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box. It's a way for us to kind of sort and, uh, and see those questions uh, as the webinar is going on. So if you can try and direct your questions through the Q&A function and your introductions in the chat. Of course, if you're having any difficulty with the Q&A feature or you can't find it, you're welcome to share your questions in the chat as well, and we'll sort it out. All right, so before I introduce um, our lineup of speakers today, I do just have um, a couple of quick polls that I want to share. So let's get our polls going. So the first question we have for you today is if you can just tell us about what sector you represent, just to give us a sense of who's on the line. And if we haven't captured your sector, you don't feel represented in the list that we've given you, please feel free to share that in the chat as well. You can let us know um, which sector or, uh, or how you identify your representation in the chat as well, if you prefer. All right, so we're just gonna give this another few seconds for people to weigh in. All right, and let's share those results back so that you can all see. So can you see those results up on the screen? Seeing nodding, great. Okay, so you can see that just about half of uh, the folks on the call today are from non-governmental organizations, then lots of academic or students as well, which is great to see. A few from government and legal community, and then a, a number in the other category. So as I said, if you would like to share where that is um, in the chat box, feel free, or what that is, I should say. All right, next question. Um, made this one a little more interesting today. So many of you will have seen me ask um, the geographic question of which Great Lake Basin you're from, because we do a lot of Great Lakes engagement work on the webinars that I participate in. But given that we're federal in focus today, we thought we would switch it up a little bit and ask you what ocean basin you are located in. And if you need a cheat sheet, there you go. So you can let us know where you are. And if you're unsure, that's okay. We have a category. And if you are calling in from somewhere completely else in the world, we have another category as well. So 
So we'll just give folks a few more seconds here. All right, you're all very speedy. Appreciate everyone's um, familiarity with their geography. All right, let's share this back. Okay, so lots in our Atlantic Ocean Basin, some Hudson Bay, some Pacific, and somebody perhaps up in Northern Ontario identifying the Arctic Ocean Basin and a couple unsure in others. So I'd be so curious if you were in the other category, let us know where you're located in the world. That would be great. Okay, and the last question we have just to help our speakers get a sense of the level of knowledge on the line is just tell us how you would sort of self-identify or rate your knowledge about the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And I know that's a very large and complicated topic, so just give us your best sense. Okay. Great. So not surprisingly, most people indicating sort of a medium level of knowledge. I'm just going to go back to our agenda slide here. Oh, lovely. It doesn't want to let me go backwards. Let me just reshare that so we can see our agenda. Sorry, one second. And again, just want to share our agenda before I turn it over. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much for participating in those polls. Really helpful to have a sense of who's on the line. If you're just joining, you're welcome to take a moment, introduce yourself um, in the chat box. All right, so this is our agenda for today, and I just quickly want to introduce all of our speakers. So a uh, first speaker that we'll be hearing from today is Joseph Castrilli, and Joe joined the Canadian Environmental Law Association in 2008 as legal counsel and as a member of the Ontario and British Columbia bars practicing in the areas of environmental and natural resources law. He's also taught environmental law courses and seminars at Queen's University, University of Toronto and Osgoode Hall Law School at York University. Then after Joe, we'll be hearing from Hugh Benavides, is a former SELA lawyer and is advising Nature Canada on this project. Among his other experience, he was the legislative assistant to the chair of the House of Commons Environment Committee, Committee when SEPA 1999 became law, and along with Faye represented the Canadian Environmental Law Association during the SEPA review around 2005 to 6. And I'm just going to make a self note that I keep using the abbreviation SEPA, which I assume many of you will know, but I'll just clarify that is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. So you're going to hear us say SELA, which refers to the Canadian Environmental Law Association, and SEPA, which is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. I know acronyms can be intimidating, so just clarifying. Then also on the line um, today, we have Ben Dula Tiari who is a specialist in water resource management and planning with a diverse range of international experience in multidisciplinary projects and public engagement. Currently, he's working at the cross-section of land use planning and the environment, and Benham's going to help facilitate and moderate our discussion today. Then also on our panel today, we have Faye DeLeon. Faye is a researcher and a paralegal with SELA. Faye holds a master's degree in public health and has worked extensively on chemicals management, pollution registries, and waste issues at all levels of governing, including the Great Lakes Basin, Federal Chemicals Management Plan, and international level. She's worked extensively on the implementation of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And last but not least, also on our panel today is Mark Butler with Nature Canada. Mark is working to ensure that the rapidly developing field of biotechnology does not have unintended and negative consequences for nature. Mark was Marine Coordinator and subsequently Policy Director with the Ecology Action Centre in Nova Scotia for 23 years. In those roles, he helped build the organization into an effective voice for conservation and sustainable prosperity. Previously, Mark worked as a marine educator, a fisheries consultant both in Canada and overseas, and as a deckhand on commercial fishing boats. He has undergraduate and graduate degrees in environmental studies. That is our roster of speakers and panelists and moderators for today. And with that, I will stop screen sharing and I will pass the mic over to Joe, who is our first presenter. And let's get Joe's deck up on the screen. Thanks, April. Let me just get myself on the screen here. Perfect. Uh, good, after good, after uh, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for uh, joining us um, to talk about. Um, we're no longer talking about Bill C. Uh, 28. We're now talking about Bill S5, 
Uh, everything you'll see in this uh, PowerPoint presentation, however, is still entirely relevant to S5 uh, as um, it essentially um, mimics uh, C28, uh, at least to this point in time. Can I have the, um, the first slide? Um, this first slide is really a nature of the uh, problem slide uh, at the global level. Uh, you can see from uh, 2019, the United Nations Environment Program issued a report which um, raised some concerns about the speed with which uh, chemicals uh, or the chemicals market is growing and um, also particularly focused on the fact that in light of that uh, speed of uh, growth uh, that releases exposures and particular burdens um, for vulnerable populations were expected uh, to be particularly high. Um, that study um, was followed closely uh, just last month with an American Chemical Society study actually published in the Environmental Science and Engineering Journal, uh, which talks about, um, uh, again, the speed with which uh, chemicals have been growing uh, since 1950. And uh, you see there, it's a 50 fold increase uh, since 1950. And the expectation is that it will be, it will triple again by 2050. Um, the article goes out of its way to talk about two particular things um, I want to mention because I think they're relevant to what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, it talks about the fact that the speed of chemical growth has made it uh, difficult, if not impossible, for governments to address that problem. Uh, and secondly, in light of that, it's now that particular article um, suggests that there is a need for a, a cap on chemical production and release, similar to what folks have been talking about over the last few years, uh, respecting a cap on carbon emissions. So I think those are two studies to, to bear in mind as we go through the situation in Canada under SEPA. The, um, Expectation, I think, for many folks, given that the fact that SEPA has not been amended for over 20 years, is that um, there is a need for uh, this statute to, to develop a much more robust approach to the issue of uh, management of chemicals in Canada. And certainly that expectation has been building uh, as the unmet needs have been building over the last uh, few years. And certainly since the uh, Standing Committee held its hearings on this matter now almost six years ago. So the question I raise for you folks today is, um, does uh, Bill S-5 uh, deliver on those concerns? The, uh, next slide. Um, this particular slide, slide four, talks about uh, some of the uh, uh, unmet needs uh, that are um, uh, viewed as of concern by the uh, national environmental community. I have chosen just five. Uh, there are certainly more than five, but um, we thought these are some of the uh, more important ones, and um, uh, we'll be talking about those throughout the course of my, uh, of my discussion this afternoon. Uh, the next slide, which is slide five, um, talks about um, the bill's emphasis, uh, at least from my perspective, what the bill um, now S5 uh, tends to emphasize uh, in its proposed amendments. And you'll see that between slides four and five, there's some overlap in terms of at least the identification of a concern, but uh, the real issue is um, how does Bill S5 address some of these concerns? And there is of course also the issue that um, uh, on a number of the uh, national and environmental communities concerns, Bill S5 does not address them at all. We move to um, slide six. Beginning with slide six, over the next eight slides, um, I'll be identifying eight concerns with um, the bill. And um, the three slides that follow those eight slides will, uh, in summary form, identify uh, proposed solutions. Um, these are all discussed in uh, greater detail in the um, uh, submissions we prepared, which we filed with uh, the ministers of health and environment last week and which are on our website and I believe would, uh, are attached as materials that you would have had access to for the purposes of this webinar. So the, the first issue I wanted to address, and, and, and it's unfortunate that I have to address uh, the fixing of something that's not broken, but um, that's the situation with the first proposed amendment or the first change I want to uh, discuss. Um, 
Bill S-5 proposes to change Schedule 1 of SEPA, which is the list of toxic substances under the Act. There are approximately 150 of them uh, in that schedule. And um, uh, the bill proposes to do at least two different things. Firstly, it wants to no longer identify that list as a list of toxic substances. Um, and I'll come back to why that's a concern in a moment. Uh, the second thing it does is it uh, divides what is currently a single schedule of 150 substances into two parts. Uh, part one, uh, or a proposed part one, would have only 19 substances in it. And it's uh, this group of substances under which um, uh, prohibition, and I, I, I assume the government here means complete prohibition from Canadian commerce is, part, uh, is possible. Um, the remaining 130 substances are now to be uh, placed in part two of schedule one and these will um, not be necessarily subject to prohibition at all and i'll come back to why that's a concern in a moment um, let me just say that um, in in the uh, submissions we prepared we discuss at length the constitutional implications of, of these changes um, and um, I'll just, in a nutshell, raise or summarize what I'm concerned about here. SEPA, uh, and in particular, Part Five of SEPA, was um, upheld um, uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada as a uh, as valid uh, criminal law in a 1997 decision called Hydro Quebec. And the basis for that uh, conclusion uh, or that finding by the court was that. Um, the statute purported to deal with uh, not the universe of all substances, although certainly the statute purports to study the universe of all substances uh, in existence in Canada, but it only proposes to address in a regulatory way, if I can put it, um, the um, uh, bad actor chemicals um, that, that are in commerce. And that's why there's 150 currently out of over 23,000 that are in Schedule 1. Uh, the concern with uh, meddling with um, Schedule 1 and the ways that, the, um, uh, that Bill S-5 proposes to do is that it begins to raise uncertainty, uh, not only in the minds of the public, but more perhaps equally of equal concern in the minds of the courts as to whether all the substances that are uh, purportedly now being addressed under sch Schedule 1 um, deserve to be treated as toxic substances. If... Um, uh, I should say that there is one uh, lawsuit already in the pipeline uh, brought by an um, in industry coalition of plastic manufacturers who raise um, the question of whether uh, plastic, for example, um, is a toxic substance, um, and if it isn't, uh, how it could possibly be um, uh, subject to controls under SEPA, a statute which um, uh, the constitutional foundation for which is the criminal law power and the focus on toxic substances. So I'll just leave that concern there uh, and simply say that you should read our submissions, which go into painful detail uh, on this issue. And um, in, in my respectful submission, uh, created a problem um, that, that didn't exist before. And in my view, the only way to solve that problem is to reverse these proposed amendments. Can I have the uh, next slide? Uh, the next con um, concern we want to address is the uh, issue of <clears throat> pollution prevention planning, which um, after 20 years is still discretionary under a part five, a part four of the statute, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and is, uh, and that's of concern because um, for the reasons that are set out, set out in this slide, um, since 2000, only one sixth of the substances um, in schedule one have been made subject to a pollution prevention plan. And you'll, you, can, you can do the math as I can do the math, uh, that if we only address 25 substances every 20 years, it's gonna take us um, probably to the beginning of the 22nd century to have a, a pollution prevention plan for every existing substance in schedule one. And in my uh, respectful submission, that's a tad too slow. Can I have the uh, next slide? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> continuing with the subject of uh, pollution prevention, there's also the issue of pollution abatement. And this is perhaps an even more concerning trend um, that's developed under uh, part four of the statute. Um, pollution prevention planning is about stemming the creation and use of toxic substances. Pollution abatement is about what it says on that second bullet, uh, controlling releases, emissions, and discharges. 
And uh, in an analysis that um, we conducted uh, and which is summarized in our submissions, uh, which you now have access to, uh, we found that um, uh, Canada had been allowing or has been allowing industry to use the pollution abatement uh, approach as a substitute for pollution prevention planning uh, a majority of the time that a pollution prevention plan has been prepared under SEPA. Um, we note, and we knew, we note in the um, in the submissions that a number of substances um, have that, that are subject to pollution prevention plans have in fact seen their on-site air emissions increase in recent years, which is just, uh, I guess, underscores the concern with uh, taking a pollution abatement approach to a regime that's supposed to be um, uh, focused on pollution prevention. Remember the uh, next slide, please. The um, uh, this um, amend uh, this uh, bill um, S five also uh, proposes to um, eliminate um, authority for uh, virtual elimination of toxic substances under the statute, and um, the concern the government has had and it's, it expresses in its background material for um, uh, Bill S five is that um, uh, the government has found that it's been very difficult to to apply uh, the virtual elimination regime because it's focused on um, uh, trying to find a level of concentration below uh, a particular quantification that would allow the substance to remain in commerce uh, but also be controlled and that's turned out to be pretty much the equivalent of trying to find um, uh, a needle in a haystack and um, what's, what's concerning is the government, instead of trying to reform the virtual elimination authority, is simply going to jettison it in favor of using a prohibition regulation under the statute as a substitute. Um, there, are some, there are a number of concerns with doing that. Number one, um, um, the prohibition regulation is often, while it has sometimes been used to actually prohibit substances, it's more often than not been used to simply prohibit, either prohibit certain uses while allowing substances to remain in commerce. Um, the, um, I should say that the um, standing committee, which examined this problem um, a number of years ago, noted that um, in their view, uh, using the prohibition regulation as a substitute for virtual elimination is not what was intended by uh, these provisions in the statute. The purpose of the prohibition regulation, if anything, was to act as a stopgap until we get to virtual elimination. Having now proposed to uh, eliminate virtual elimination as an authority whatsoever under federal law, we seem to be going sideways on this issue. And in my view, uh, we need to uh, get back to the basics of what virtual elimination was all about. It was never about trying to, again, reduce emissions. It was about um, a, a, attempting to uh, eliminate the generation and use of substances altogether. Um, that's the proper focus for the virtual elimination authority. And unfortunately, that's not how the government has been using it over the last 20 years, and which explains why it's been virtually unused during that period of time. The uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide uh, is really, uh, I guess, um, uh, a segue to uh, the need for us to much more forcefully um, uh, view alternatives analysis as a central focus of uh, our federal toxics law uh, rather than an afterthought. You'll see in, in this slide that, among other things, there are almost no references that, uh, to alternatives in the bill. There are a couple. Uh, only 19 substances in part one are, uh, are eligible for substitution as a result of the proposed amendments. That's 13, that's only 13% of all the toxic substances in schedule one. The great majority of substances in schedule one are not uh, eligible for alternatives in light of the way in which um, the amendments have been drafted. And more importantly, remember that I said earlier that the government has been using the pollution prevention regime um, as a pollution abatement regime so that for all intents and purposes, we're never going to see um, uh, alternatives applied to these substances, 87% um, of the substances, if in fact we're uh, approaching these substances as, uh, as only needing to be um, have their emissions abated as, as opposed to looking for alternatives for these chemicals altogether. Uh, next slide. Healthy environment. Um, it's identified in a couple of places in Bill S-5. 
um, it, al it always appears with a caveat uh, with respect to balancing the right um, with economic and other factors. Uh, we understand the government is at least contemplating possible changes um, to that authority. We haven't yet seen what they may be. Um, uh, in our view, it's difficult to have a right when you have those kinds of caveats, um, number one. Uh, but number two, it's even more difficult to uh, take the right seriously if there's no remedy for it. And the problem with SEPA over the last 20 years is that the existing citizen suit remedy has never been used. Um, and the reason it's never been used is because the number of procedural barriers to its use that were built into the statute uh, in the uh, 1999 amendments. Um, there have been many proposals to um, reform this um, problem, um, but uh, I note in this particular slide, the government has not proposed any amendments to, to the citizen suit authority. And so in my respectful submission, it's highly unlikely that the right to a healthy environment will be used any more than the, than the um, current uh, citizen suit provision has been used over the last 20 years. Next slide. Lack of mandatory testing is um, an issue that um, affects a number of proposals that I think are good ones in, in Bill S-5, um, but uh, I think are hampered by the, the lack of, uh, I won't say it's, it's not a lack of a testing authority, it's a lack of the mandatory obligation to test imposed on the minister and imposed on the, uh, on, on the private sector. Um, for example, uh, the amendments uh, authorize the collection of data on whether a substance is an endocrine uh, disruptor or not. And the bill also authorizes the minister to consider available information on vulnerable populations and cumulative effects of a potential substance. The problem with, with um, this authority is that uh, in none of these cases does the bill direct the minister to require testing by industry when for whatever reasons there's an information gap on whether a substance is toxic or not. That's a problem. Um, we can't always rely on analogs uh, to other substances to determine whether a substance is, is toxic or not. Uh, we sometimes have to obligate uh, industry to engage in testing before a substance is used or continues to be used in Canada. And that kind of authority, while it's the, the authority to require testing has always been in the statute, the obligation to basically make it mandatory for the, for the minister to do it in certain circumstances, such as when uh, data is inadequate to make a determination, is not there. And in, in our respectful submission, it should be uh, placed there. Next slide. Um, Ambient air quality problems by toxics um, are a concern across the country for certain substances such as lead, uh, for example. And um, uh, the, uh, our submissions talk about some of the current data with respect to lead, um, uh, on-site air emissions of lead nationally can, uh, increased by about 14% in the period 2013 to 2019. Um, I think it's long past due that we should um, not be having uh, lead emissions increase in this country. Uh, one way to address that is to basically, basically create ambient air authority to deal with it. Uh, the um, 2017 Standing Committee report on SEPA recommended exactly that. Uh, however, Bill C-28 is completely silent on this. Um, and I'll come back in a moment to what CELA proposes to do about it. Uh, next slide, please. So those were the, uh, in a short form, eight of the concerns that we have with uh, Bill S-5. Uh, this, these next three slides quickly talk about what we think should be done. Um, firstly, with respect to um, uh, the list of toxic substances, I think I've probably already mentioned that uh, sufficiently. Um, we think the amendments should be reversed. Uh, uh, on the subject of um, virtual elimination, uh, we think that too needs to be, uh, um, modified, not eliminated for the reasons that I've said out, uh, uh, mentioned earlier, and also I set out in our submissions. Uh, next slide. Uh, we need to make pollution prevention planning mandatory for all Schedule One substances. Um, the 22nd century is too long to wait to, uh, to get this done. Um, we need to also, in conjunction with that authority, strictly limit the use of pollution abatement measures as substitutes for pollution prevention planning. Uh, we need to make um, substitution a central focus of SEPA. And our proposed amendments um, that we drafted three years ago, which are attached as, um, to our um, submissions to the government that we filed last week, we actually have a, an entire um, 
part of this of our proposal um, uh, focused on the issue of substitution. Um, on the issue of right to a healthy environment, it clearly needs to be clarified. The um, obfuscating caveats need to be removed and it needs to be made enforceable by removing the barriers to, that exist to the existing remedy if it's going to work at all. Uh, next slide. We need to make uh, testing mandatory for the reasons I uh, outlined earlier. And finally, we need um, uh, legally binding and enforceable national ambient air quality standards for the selected substance, toxic substances we uh, identify in our submissions. Um, next slide. Um, just very quickly in terms of conclusions, um, we need to more than housekeeping measures. We need robust changes in Bill S5. Uh, we um, do not need to fix what isn't broken, but we do need to correct what's not working. And uh, in my view, uh, the Canadian public should not have to wait another 20 years to fix in 2040 what we know is long overdue for reform today. And I'd um, be happy to entertain your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, so once again, if people have questions uh, in response to Joe's presentation, we encourage you to try and pose those in the Q&A box. And if you're having any difficulty with the Q&A box, feel free to use the chat. All right, at this time, I would like to turn the mic over to Hugh Benavides from Nature Canada to talk with us a bit more. Go ahead, Hugh. All right, thanks, April. And uh, it's great to see such a big crowd uh, interested in SEPA reform. We really need people to demonstrate uh, to parliamentarians that they want to see changes that go beyond what is in Bill S5. Uh, and so I'll start by saying that uh, the recommendations that I'll talk about from Nature Canada and those of CELA that Joe has just done and great uh, brief uh, that, that Joe and CELA have put together and great presentation. Thank you, Joe. Um, they really complement, uh, our recommendations really complement each other. Um, because of the experience with uh, a genetically engineered salmon that many of you have heard us talk about before called AquAdvantage Salmon, um, our recommendations focus, and that case is sort of a, what I'll call a pollution of nature uh, example, our recommendations focus more on the front end of the process um, uh, by, and, and while trying to uphold and reinforce the constitutional basis of SEPA of parts five and six that Joe described, for example, the definition of toxic, we leave all that in place. We want to uh, use a more precautionary approach that involves the public early in, uh, in SEPA. And I'll explain some of that. And I think our recommendations really give meat to the original intentions of SEPA around pollution prevention and virtual elimination. In the case of species like the uh, AquAdvantage salmon, uh, the horse, if you will, is already out of the barn and we need a more precautionary approach. So, um, there we are. Um, Joe referred to a 2022 study and I'll just give you the title here um, of that uh, paper that was published just last month. It continues, it's not all new, it continues years of research on the notion of um, so-called planetary boundaries. Um, and one of the boundaries that researchers propose is in relation to um, the planet's capacity to handle uh, novel entities, which traditionally uh, meant chemicals. But the paper uh, tells us that in 2015, this team explicitly included uh, changed the definition or expanded it to include novel uh, modified life forms. Um, so I think that's critical background. We're pushing uh, the planetary boundary for novel entities and, and that's critical background for the reforms that we're looking for here. Um, CEPA uh, 1999 already uh, does, is structured in a way that acknowledges um, both chemicals um, they, CEPA uses a definition of substances, which is extremely broad, and those are dealt with mostly in part five that Joe's talked about. And there's also a term defined in part six called living organisms, which is, the point of this slide is just to show that a living organism is a substance. It's a particular type that's an animate prod, product of 
biotechnology. Um, parts five and six are virtually mirrors um, of each other. So there's a parallel process in each part. They're quite similar. Uh, our recommendations for part uh, six in many cases could apply to part five. Also, it's important to note that part six has received uh, traditionally and historically far less attention than part five. So I think that's another uh, impetus for, uh, for saying that we really need to reform part six as well. It's long overdue. Um, Joe also mentioned substitution by safer alternatives. Uh, this is another article published last year, uh, which demystifies um, uh, the use uh, or the inquiry into need for uh, chemicals, living, new living organisms, uh, novel entities, we can use that expression. Um, and it's relevant to our recommendations because it's not all that radical this paper suggests to require a discussion of need. Um, it uses the term essentiality, but it uh, really talks about um, uh, substitution and alternatives. And uh, as I'll show once again, with our recommendations for part six, we're hoping to look at the question of need and alternatives at the beginning of the process, long before you ever have to look at regulation. Uh, do, we, do we need uh, a new substance? Or a new living organism, new living organism in the in Canada or indeed the world. So the problems uh, with with the process, based on the experience with the uh, genetically engineered salmon I mentioned, there was no public notice of uh, the notification, which is where the proponent says, "Hey, we've got this new uh, new animal we want to introduce uh, and manufacture." Um, and there's no notification of the proponent's request for a waiver of providing some information requirements. So the public doesn't know until uh, much later, uh, much after the fact. Um, there's no consultation to obtain the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples as required uh, by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in short, there's no public involvement in the scientific um, assessments. And so the next four slides just summarize what we've been proposing to government uh, for the last couple of years, and we'll continue to push and hope for your support in the uh, review of Bill S-5. Um, where a living organism, that's LO, is an animal that has a wild counterpart uh, in nature, the ministers should be required to give public notice that an assessment will be conducted, and they have to involve the public in the assessment including uh, allowing uh, the public to test the evidence that's put forward by the proponent uh, and, and uh, government experts as well, um, and give timely access to all steps in the process. And uh, the public and, and their experts if needed should have the opportunity to present their own evidence. And the proponent should have the burden to uh, show that there's a demonstrable need for that living or organism, or if that organism is already uh, present in the environment, uh, they should have to show a need for a, a significant new activity involving the living organism. And significant new activity is a, is a concept particular to SEPA. Um, and the proponent should also show that the living organism is not toxic or capable of becoming toxic. And that's the part of SEPA that's already there. Um, but we're, show, we're asking, as uh, public interest groups have for decades, that the burden be shifted to the um, proponent to, to demonstrate that. Uh, the minister, as I alluded to earlier, that's the, when I say minister with, in the singular, that means the environment and climate change minister should be required to announce the process steps in a more timely and public manner so that involvement can happen uh, in, a, in a, an effective way. And he should be required by the act to make regulations prescribing public participation processes in the assessment, which is very early, uh, very early stage uh, of the process. Um, and overall, uh, 
we'd like to see that SEPA is aligned with indigenous rights and we want to emphasize um, public rights to environmental um, information and decision making. And last point, can't emphasize it enough that these need to, as part of SEPA's overall ethos, trump claims of business confidentiality, which frankly is one of the big barriers to the, all the public involvement and transparency that we are asking for. So I've also been asked to speak about parliamentary uh, process and the, the path that Bill S5 will take over the next weeks and months. Um, so I'll do that with my remaining minute or two. Um, so online, you can find uh, something called Legis Info, uh, the status of any bill. And so Bill S5 was introduced on Wednesday, February 9, uh, in the uh, Senate of Canada. And on the left, you can see the steps that the bill has taken and will take in the Senate. And then unlike other, what you may be used to, uh, that process will, uh, the bill will proceed through the House of Commons uh, second rather than first. And I'll expand on this a little more. Um, it's much more often that a government bill is introduced in the House of Commons, but it's not uh, completely unusual for a bill to be introduced in the Senate. Um, and the other point I just wanted to make is that uh, while we have a minority uh, situation, we call it a minority parliament, but usually we're referring to the House of Commons, which makes passing government bills more complicated than, than a majority parliament in the House. We've also had a similar situation in the Senate over the past few years, and uh, I won't go into the details of that, but um, you'll see a bit more in a slide in a moment. Um, but the process there is also less predictable because you don't have uh, the traditional, if I can use that word, situation where you had the governing party with perhaps a majority and then one other party with most of the other um, uh, seats in the Senate. And so it's very difficult because it's much more common for a bill to start in the House of Commons to find this online uh, image like this for the Senate. This is green because it's the House of Commons, but as I said, it's the same process that happens in both places. So if I look at uh, second reading, I'm pointing out there, um, there's debate which uh, will occur number and members just debate or discuss the principle of the bill. And normally what happens at the end of that is that there's a motion to refer uh, the bill to a committee uh, of, of the Senate in this case. And uh, that's not required, I've learned, in the Senate, but I think it's highly likely that it will go to a, the, uh, uh, a Senate committee. At the committee stage, the next stage, um, uh, normally uh, government officials like the ministers of environment and health probably and their officials will appear uh, and give evidence and then other experts will be asked to appear and uh, give their suggestions for the bill. And then at the end of that, committee stage, senators can come forward, who are on that committee, can come forward with amendments that they propose to the bill. And um, the committee votes on those amendments, passes some perhaps, rejects others perhaps, and then reports the bill with new proposed changes, if any, back to the full Senate. And that's called report stage. And uh, the senators can debate those changes that have been proposed by the committee. Uh, senators who are not involved in the committee process can also propose further amendments. So it's important that you, to know that amendments can happen there. And then the next stage is third reading. Same, um, same thing applies there. Uh, I believe, yeah, amendments can be posed um, there. And then uh, the bill is referred to, here it says Senate, but to the House of Commons for uh, virtually that same process happening again. So I, I mentioned that the um, uh, seat count in the Senate is a bit um, uh, is 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 a bit different. You don't no longer have two main caucuses, perhaps, and perhaps a few independents. You know how now have these three, four, four main groups, and uh, because there's no longer a Liberal caucus, most of those non-affiliated um, senators, or at least three of them, are representatives of the government. So they help to shepherd uh, a bill through. And there are now, for, at the moment, there are 14 vacant seats in the House. So um, 
by my math, which is always shaky, I think a majority is 46 seats. So any changes that are happening in the full Senate or that are proposed are made, uh, rule require uh, at least 46 votes to make those changes. I've gone a bit over time. So uh, those are the parts I want to cover and I look forward to the discussion and any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hugh. I know we asked you to do an extra piece on the parliamentary process there, so perfectly okay that you went a few minutes over. Uh, at this time, I would like to ask all our speakers and panelists to turn their cameras on, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Benim to manage our Q&A portion. And I'll just remind everyone that we do have until 2.15 today. We booked an hour and 15 minutes, so hopefully you all have that time available, which gives us a nice big chunk of time to discuss some questions. So thank you everyone for, and I see a lot of questions are coming in. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. There's been lots of different questions. So I'll start with one for Hugh, who is, uh, they're asking why, um, can you please explain your recommendations are especially important for living organisms with counterparts in the wild? Uh, Sorry, I hadn't read the question. So um, explain why they're important for, um, for, uh, for living organisms, organisms in the wild. With counterpart in the wild. Well, it's uh, primarily based on the experience that we've had with uh, this uh, genetically engineered fish and Mark can go into more detail if, if we want, if, if, if it's wanted. Uh, but it, it was uh, essentially an Atlantic salmon with uh, a species called ocean pout, part of its genetic material, and also another salmon uh, species. Uh, and the, uh, uh, one of the intentions was to produce a fish that, that grew more quickly. And the, the proponent has, uh, has committed to only grow the species in uh, closed containment in, uh, on, on land. So it's not a fish that's been introduced to the wild, but there's nevertheless less a risk um, that at some point, as more and more of these fish are produced, that the uh, safeguards that are in place could fail. Uh, after all, nothing is completely fail safe. And so um, if, if that should happen uh, and the genetically engineered salmon were to contaminate, reproduce with uh, Atlantic salmon in the wild, then we would have changed nature inadvertently. Um, so one can imagine just an endless number of different examples where a new living organism is introduced that's been genetically engineered and threatens a wild counterpart. I hope that uh, answers the question somewhat. I guess uh, one question to bring up while we're on the topic of uh, part six is, um, the changes that are being proposed, the definition of toxic substances have an impact not only on part five of the, the act, but there uh, have also impacts on the other parts, especially part six. So I was wondering if Joe can elaborate on how this definition and the changes proposed will have an uh, carry on effect to the other parts of the, the act, especially part six. You're on mute, Joe. Sorry, could you repeat the very first part of your question? Uh, I, I didn't quite get it. So the interrelationship between part five and part six, I think the changes being proposed to the definition of toxic substance and the changes to uh, the schedule one will have an impact on part six as well, because they rely on section 64 of the act in identifying what is a toxic substance or toxic organism. Well, um, uh, Faye, the, I, I, Faye will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't believe there are any uh, uh, products of biotechnology that are uh, identified in Schedule One of, uh, of CEPA. Um, so that's uh, been a problem, I guess, with the Act uh, since its inception. Um, the the new uh, uh, approach, which is basically to uh, introduce uncertainty as to whether schedule one is or uh, is not uh, exclusively about toxic substances uh, uh, is going to, uh, to the extent it, it's gonna cause problems uh, with respect to industrial chemicals. It's also gonna cause problems with respect to uh, uh, products of biotechnology. Um, 
as to, uh, you know, for example, I would, I would imagine um, uh, if we ever see a, a product of biotechnology get introduced to or added to schedule one, it would be added to uh, part two or the proposed part two, uh, which uh, is a part that for all intents and purposes, the government doesn't ever propose to uh, prohibit the substance only to manage it. So arguably that's what a, a product of biotechnology would, would be facing if it was ever um, um, uh, able to get uh, into the schedule to begin with. Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, this is uh, interesting about the process and uh, people are interested to know what is the advantage of the bill now being introduced in the Senate as opposed to the normal process that it would go through the House of Commons? If I may, uh, the minister said um, among his re remarks that he was having it introduced in the Senate because uh, of the queue of bills and the, the crowding of bills in the House of Commons. So uh, if you imagine two separate racetracks, uh, the House of Commons one is, is quite busy, the Senate not, not as much. And so uh, you just, or there's less traffic. It's not a racetrack. There's less traffic on the, on, in the Senate. So the idea is that it would get through uh, the Senate while other bills are proceeding through the House. Um, and, uh, but as I think I've shown, um, you know, he still needs to get the bill through the House of Commons at some point where it might also, the House may also be crowded at that time. But at least he's getting it started. That's the intention. Thank you very much. I would like to bring it back to a question that was raised earlier about plastics. And I'm going to read the question. It's a little uh, complicated. Is the problem that is the problem? There is, there has been no study done on plastic pollution and the effect of human fauna on human or fauna health. So there is no real knowledge about the actual effects. Anecdotally, we can see that the harm that is done to fish, but lack, uh, there is a lack of studies on the problem. Should part of what is being submitted to Environment Canada be, include requests for such studies? And I think something Mark can uh, address. No? Um, I'll add a few comments, um, Benham, um, which is when the government did their risk assessment on plastics, um, over the last few years, uh, they did acknowledge that the scope of the assessment um, did not include uh, investigating the health impacts uh, associated with plastics. Uh, it's certainly needed, uh, but they had enough time and enough information to demonstrate that it, it did pose a, uh, an impact to the environment or um, is seen as being problematic to the environment. And so it therefore met the, the criteria under Section 64 of SEPA. Uh, that said, I think there needs to be a lot more focus around um, highlighting and bringing forward uh, the impacts associated with um, uh, to human health and to them to to wildlife specifically. Um, so, as part of the uh, submission that you shared with us, there has been there was a section covering. Uh, 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 some data that from the NPRI database, and it shows that on-site industrial emissions uh, for some of the substances on the toxic list have been increasing from for the period of 2013 to 2019. And this is interesting because um, uh, this is not, I guess, a great news story for part four and part five of the act that we're supposed to address this. So I was wondering if uh, we can have a discussion about um, what this means in terms of the continued approach that the government is proposing to use the pollution prevention plans as a way of dealing with this. And particularly because release of toxic substances both affect the environment and also affect uh, human health, the different pathways. So what does this mean for impact on vulnerable people? And is the proposal that is being put forward by this bill sufficient to address that? Um, do you want me to answer that first, Benham, and then I'll pass it on to Joe? Sounds good. Okay, so I'll just give context in terms of the, the data that we used uh, to, to do that. And it is one aspect of looking at what the government's done so far on 
uh, chemicals that have been found SEPA toxic um, under the legislation. Um, we relied on uh, the government's own inventory, the National Pollutants Release Inventory, basically to identify um, uh, chemicals uh, that have been already reported to the government and, and generally focused on um, uh, the bigger um, facilities, uh, the report under the National Pollutants Release Inventory. Now, this program really tracks 200, uh, over 260 uh, pollutants, some of which, a subset of which, are known to be um, uh, known or suspected carcinogens and also uh, to be uh, SEPA toxic. And for those chemicals that have that we looked at for that subset of chemicals uh, that includes uh, lead, um, uh, naphthalene, and, and uh, chemicals like toluene uh, diisocyanate, uh, we noticed that between 2013 and 2019, uh, there there were increases uh, to air releases um, from from all sources across Canada, uh, reporting on those substances. Um, and, and you know so. Uh, there are also groups of chemicals that have not demonstrated to, uh, to increase over that time period between 2013 and 2019. Um, but, you know, enough, uh, there's about 13 of those chemicals out of, um, I believe, uh, 42 uh, chemicals that were identified as being carcinogens and SEPA toxic um, that, that demonstrated um, uh, an increase over time. Um, why that's important, in, in my view, is you know if there's a focus around uh, addressing uh, carcinogens in a more, more um, substantive way um, through the proposed um, um, S5 bill, um, you know there's going to be challenges. Wh whether those chemicals end up in Part One or Part Two makes a difference. Right now, most of those chemicals are in Part Two, in the proposed Part Two. Um, so, do, will we really get to a point where we can address that um, fully? Um, right now, not so much, uh, because part of the problem is that um, there's been control mechanisms put in place for many of those chemicals or not, right? So that, that's, that's a real uh, challenge uh, for us going forward. So this, um, you know, the data sets that we're, we were looking at really is to just demonstrate how you can use this data to, to, to um, d um, highlight um, some of the, possibly some of the deficiencies, the weaknesses in the approach that the government is proposing under the bill. Um, Joe? Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you. I, I agree with what um, Faye said. Uh, let me add um, uh, the perspective of a lawyer on science, if I can do that. Um, when I look at the data that um, Faye was able to assemble, and we've reproduced it in our submissions at tables uh, one, two, and three, uh, what I'm, you have to realize those, we, we just focused on on site air emissions of um, toxic substances that are in Schedule One. Uh, of SEPA, which means the government has already identified as some of the, uh, uh, these chemicals as some of the worst of the worst. Um, and we also only chose um, Schedule One toxic substances that are cancer causing agents. So we're looking at a very small number of substances. Uh, I think in, in the case of all those um, tables, maybe 15 or so substances, um, but they're A, Schedule one toxic substances and their and B their cancer causing agents, and for every one of the um, uh, substances in our schedule uh, schedule one two and three, um, those substances increased over this seven or six or seven year period two thousand thirteen to two thousand nineteen. Now, SEPA is supposed to deal with toxic substances, not simply, in fact, not even predominantly by abatement. I mean, abatement is clearly an authority uh, under the statute for part five, but under part four, part four is about getting substances, certain substances out of commerce altogether. And um, some of these substances have been around for a real long time. And um, uh, when I see increases, not only of, um, uh, a few percentage points, but in the case of um, one or two of the substances which had um, uh, pollution prevention plans, which turned out to be basically pollution abatement plans, I see that the increases for those substances, and I'll just choose one here um, uh, if I can, um, bear with me for a moment. Uh, I think it's the same one that, um, uh, uh, Faye mentioned, which I can barely pronounce, uh, toluene diosocyanate. Uh, and I'll look at it firstly for um, Ontario uh, data for um, 2013 to 2019. 
726% increase in on-site air emissions of a Schedule I toxic substance that's also a carcinogen. Um, that's for Ontario in that seven-year period. And then um, nationally for the same substance, uh, again, for the same uh, seven-year period, 2013 to 2019, again, recognizing A, it's a toxic, it's a um, Schedule I toxic substance, uh, so identified by the government of Canada. And secondly, it's a cancer-causing agent. Nationally, on-site air emissions for that same substance went up 825% in that seven-year period. So when I see those kinds of numbers, um, uh, and, and, and you'll and if you go back to our if you go to our submissions and you look at the part of the of the uh, submissions that deal with what's the purpose of pollution prevention plans, it was not to create an abatement exercise. Um, it wasn't about pollution control. It was about getting the the hardcore bad actors out of Canadian commerce altogether. Full stop. That's not what's happening under uh, CEPA right now. And I think in my respectful submission. Um, uh, it needs to start happening and it should start happening with Bill S5. End of sermon. That's a great sermon and it's a very important point to make. Um, we have another question here that uh, um, I, they're raising the concern that the bill as it stands now is explicitly taking a risk-based approach as opposed to a precautionary approach. And that's that's been a theme that has come up uh, in the past, and I think there's a consensus um, in the environmental community that the burden of proof should be on the, the polluters and they have to provide uh, uh, whether something is toxic or not. I guess, could you uh, elaborate on alternative approaches? I think in the European Union and the REACH framework, they uh, take a different approach to this. And uh, would that type of approach be applicable in Canada? And uh, how would that, uh, I guess, why would that not be the case in, in Canada? Um, I think Fay will want to say something about this, but let me, let me start. Uh, REACH is exactly um, what we should be looking at um, uh, in terms of their approach to dealing with um, hard, or not, not hardcore baddies, uh, bad actor chemicals. Um, in terms of uh, whether they need to be subject to a, a substitution analysis um, where the burden is on the um, owner of the substance to demonstrate why it should continue to be uh, to, to remain in commerce. That's the gist of the authorization portion of the REACH um, uh, regulation in Europe. And that's what I think should be incorporated into SEPA. Um, the amendments that we drafted in 2018 for SEPA, we were, we were thinking that the bill was going to be introduced three years ago. We were wrong by, I guess, four years. Um, basically takes that approach. It, it says, let's focus, let's begin, since we have apparently almost no history of dealing with alternatives um, under SEPA generally, let's start with the substances that are in Schedule 1, and let's subject those puppies, all 150 of them, to uh, the kind of alternative analysis that uh, is, is engaged in in Europe under REACH. And let's see which ones continue to be um, viable uh, for, uh, for staying in Canadian commerce and which need to be removed. Uh, because that was the ultimate and original purpose of SEPA, to, to ensure that we did not have the really horrible chemicals stay in the market and we try to manage them forever and not do a very good job about it. So I, I think we need to uh, take the REACH approach, which I think on the spectrum of um, all hazard versus all um, risk is somewhere in the middle or maybe closer to the, um, to the, to the hazard approach to regulation of chemicals. Um, we're much, uh, Canada is much closer to the um, risk uh, approach on that same spectrum. And I think we need to move closer to the hazard spectrum. Uh, and, and I think um, the REACH, REACH approach is certainly a model to follow in that regard. Fade, would you like to add something? Um, not much more than the fact that, you know, Joe highlighted in his uh, presentation um, some key areas that need to be fixed in SEPA, which includes, you know, some mandatory testing requirements that should be, you know, imposed on um, the government as well as the um, um, industry who'd be interested in, in introducing or and using um, substances. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that the right now the risk-based approach in, in entrenched in 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 the legislation 
really rely, is looking to information that's already out there available. Uh, so that even makes it much more difficult to get to the point where we're talking about uh, emphasis around looking at hazard, um, the hazards associated with chemicals. Um, and what does this mean overall in terms of um, addressing and promoting uh, the need for a preventive approach? Um, I think it's challenging um, given um, those gaps and, and more challenging given um, the framework that it has to work within. Uh, so, you know, key things um, including transparency, including um, de um, dealing with um, um, gaps, um, needing to, to fill them with uh, mandatory testing are certainly areas that could improve uh, the process. But um, certainly at the moment, the bill uh, continues to um, uh, entrench and support that risk-based approach. And uh, the need for a substitution is, is part of the way that you could, you could deal with um, uh, the deficiencies in the, in the, in the approach and the framework. Um, I wonder if I can bring the discussion back to the right to a healthy environment. So in, I have in my personal work some experience with uh, dealing with environmental protection on, on the local and the provincial side. And oftentimes when, you, when it comes to making a decision, the, it comes down to the text of the statute and any enforcement capabilities that is built in there. So without having any direct recourse to uh, compel someone to do something, it's very difficult to get any type of positive results. So uh, you've already discussed briefly about where uh, the Bill C-28 and S-5 is lacking at regard, in, in that regard. But I wonder if you can elaborate, Joe, on your recommendations, how the bill can be improved to uh, provide measures for the right to the healthy environment. Uh, thanks, uh, Benham. Um, let me say a, a couple of things in that regard. Um, there are uh, in our proposed, you know, I should say, part of our 2018 amendments that we drafted for SEPA, um, we um, have, uh, uh, I guess, unilaterally repealed the existing Section 22 of the Act, which is the section of the Act that was um, put in, this, in, in SEPA 1999, and it's the section of the act that has not been used once in 23 years uh, because of all the procedural obstacles that are also included in section 22. So in our version of section 22, we uh, unilaterally repealed that section 22 and introduced a completely new um, series of amendments, which are uh, based on the work uh, of other lawyers across the country over the last um, uh, few years, including a number of uh, bills that were introduced in parliament over the last few years. And we uh, updated it uh, some more uh, for the purposes of installing it directly into SEPA. And so uh, our approach is that um, you want a right to a healthy environment. That's what that's what the provision should say. It should not simply say it in the um, uh, preamble. It needs to say it in the um, purpose section of the act. And there has to be an operative section of the act where you have an unequivocal right to a healthy environment, but then you need a remedy. And that's what uh, the original section 22 of the act was supposed to provide. But because of all the procedural obstacles that are included has never been invoked by anybody and would arguably never be invoked because of, of the obstacles. So we removed all the obstacles and um, uh, we think a combination of having an unequivocal right to a healthy environment and a comprehensive approach to um, how the remedy would work um, uh, is eminently capable of being installed directly in SEPA as we did in 2018. Uh, maybe before we uh, file any amendments with the government in connection with S5, we may do some minor tweaking, but um, I think um, the approach we've set out um, is, is the approach um, to follow. I should note by the way that um, we're not the only ones who've complained about the inadequacy of the remedy. Um, the, to the 19, well, the, the 2007 and the 2017 uh, standing committees on the environment, which looked at um, uh, SEPA, were also concerned about the, op the procedural obstacles in section 22. Uh, in fact, the 2017 report indicated that the government had identified for the committee that section 22 had never been invoked and that the government was bringing that issued to the attention of the 2017 Standing Committee. Well, the 2017 com uh, Standing Committee took that seriously and said, you need to amend Section 22. But for whatever reasons, there are no amendments in Bill S-5 
improving Section 22. So we think um, it, it should be done and it can be done. And we've uh, set out a way to do it in our proposed amendments. Thank you very much. Um, we've, we've focused a lot on the part five uh, of the act, but I wanted to make sure we address uh, part six as well. So I was wondering if Mark and Hugh, you can comment on how the proposed bill is addressing your concerns uh, about part six of SIPA. I can do that. Thanks, Benham. Uh, really, uh, C28 and now S5 just make some minor administrative changes to part six. Um, they don't address our concerns at all. And related to that, I just want to come back to two things that have been raised in the chat, but also uh, discussed here. Um, on the risk-based approach and the definition of toxic, if you look at a, a straightforward reading of Section 64, a substance is, and I'll paraphrase, a substance is toxic or a genetically engineered um, organism is toxic if it has or may have a long-term or harmful effect on the environment or on its biological diversity, uh, or that may constitute a danger to the environment. If you and I read that and we see a, a, a genetically engineered organism that may enter the environment, under, you know, then we would say that easily meets that, uh, that definition. Um, however, the way that this section is interpreted sets the thresholds currently much higher. Um, so I think there's a multi-part attack on that to make, uh, uh, to get, to get, to, to meet, a, to create a lower threshold for what is toxic. One is that bird shift of burden. And I've seen some comments and questions in the chat uh, on that. Another is what we proposed a better opportunity for third party expertise to enter into assessment uh, discussions. So it's not just the proponents information and the government wider participation. And we may also need uh, other changes to the risk assessment process, which is guided not directly by the act, but in regulation and, and uh, process and so on. So it's, it's a daunting task, but it's one that's important both for chemicals and for um, uh, and for GE animals or uh, organisms. And secondly, uh, there's been some discussion about wild counterpart. Um, I think that's probably right. We wanted to draw, draw attention to uh, the salmon example where the, the wild counterpart was the Atlantic salmon. But I think those in the chat and commenting saying that wild counterpart is probably not essential are probably right, but we wanted to grab the attention. Uh, we'll look at that and consider proposing it without that language. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, would you like to add something? Well, I know we're coming to the uh, end of this. And just to go back to the question about salmon, uh, that's the first genetically engineered food animal in the world. But uh, there are others uh, coming, most likely fish. Uh, Japan just approved a genetically engineered uh, sea bream, which has a wild counterpart. They're also talking about approving um, a grouper, no, sorry, not a group, a puffer fish and uh, Pacific mackerel, which if anybody understands marine ecosystems is a hugely important species um, uh, for in the food web. And of course the concern here is contamination of the wild species, genetic, uh, genetic pollution. And then there's this kind of, uh, depending on your point of view, but certainly mine dystopian view that We'll all be uh, engineering species in our basement in the coming uh, decades, do it yourself, genetic engineering. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of risks that we want to uh, get ahead of now. Thank you very much. Uh, April, how much time do we have? Uh, there's lots more questions to ask. <laughs> We're in our last minute. So ideally if we can move to closing remarks. Okay, so I guess I'll pass that on uh, to uh, first Mark and then Faye. Okay, I want to do a very quick uh, thank yous. I want to thank April for consummate chairing uh, uh, of this section, excellent. Uh, and also uh, Benham uh, for his chairing. And I just want to note that uh, uh, Benham uh, first started, uh, we first met Benham in, uh, as a participant in one of these uh, webinars and, and look where he is uh, now. Um, thanks uh, Joe and Hugh for your really uh, 
uh, learned presentation with a focus on the changes that need to be made to SEPA. And thanks to Faye for all her work in organizing and all the number crunching she has done around the MPRI uh, data, which is hugely important because that's what it's all about. It's the chemicals that we're uh, being exposed to and she's come up with some really disturbing uh, data there. So thanks so much for that, Faye. Uh, just two points I wanna make. It's been 22 years. Uh, since SEPA was amended. Lots and lots has changed in many ways uh, in, over the last 22 years. And I think that should count for something when uh, legislators look at this act, there's a lot to fix. Uh, so it's not a five year uh, cycle, it's a 22 year cycle. And I wanna end on a hopeful note. Uh, you know, the minister has indicated, and I put that quote in the chat that uh, he's, uh, willing to work with all parties. He's willing to work with stakeholders. So I hope he, he's sincere and let's work with him and everybody else to make, uh, to make some uh, significant changes to the act as Joe and Hugh have identified the gaps that need to be fixed. Thank you. And just one comment on that note, Mark, I, I do wanna thank everyone, the speakers, um, um, panelists and, and certainly April's um, uh, expertise on running these webinars. We couldn't have do, done it without her. Um, and I, I, you know, just to reiterate that opportunity that exists um, to make changes to the legislation um, exists there. We do have a number of resources that we included in the Q&A, this last slide that you might wanna go to, but also it's on our website and, and Nature Canada's website as well. And we are open to um, speaking more on these issues um, in the coming months. So, you know, um, we didn't answer all the questions, but we certainly will uh, take those into consideration and um, reach out to those folks who we couldn't get to on, on the call. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much, Faye. And just a very last 10 second plug, all of the links that Faye put in this closing slide here, um, I've just dropped into the chat box. So you're welcome to grab those. Um, but as Faye said, they're both on the CELA website and the Nature Canada website. And then if I could ask everyone to take a moment and just fill out a very quick uh, evaluation survey, that link is in the chat. And if Zoom cooperates, it should pop up on your browser when you leave the webinar as well. And on that note, I will say thank you all very much for giving us an hour and 18 minutes of your time out of your busy schedules. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.